Hi, uh, good afternoon uh, or good morning uh, to everyone. Um, welcome to today, today's uh, MEF briefing um, on business SMS, uh, SIM farms and the data protection risk. I'm Joanne Lacey, uh, the COO at MEF, um, and um, I'm delighted to uh, welcome um, uh, some members uh, today. Uh, I have with me Mariana Muller, a Senior Partner Manager of Digital Processes and Services from Telefonica in Germany. Um, Robert Gertzman, um, co-founder and chief uh, evangelist at Cinch, uh, and Rafa Pelon, um, associate from uh, Pelon, um, uh, and bringing the legal muscle today, uh, and also MEF board director. Um, so today's topic uh, is very close to MEF's heart. Um, we're looking at both uh, uh, in the messaging program, combating fraud in the A2P messaging ecosystem, and also um, about building sustainable and trusted channels for both consumers and business alike. Um, so this topic is, is, is um, uh, very key to us and is about a white paper um, that we recently published. So do encourage you to download the paper um, if you haven't already done so. Um, so I'm going to kick off uh, by introducing, uh, letting Robert talk more about the topic um, and take you through uh, some of the risks, the impacts and the recommendations um, that um, uh, on this subject. Robert, I'll hand to you. All right. Thank you, Joanne. Hello, everyone. Um, good. If we move forward, um, I'll start with a little bit of a, of a background, um, just taking a look at the, the business SMS uh, ecosystem. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, this has grown to become a, a fairly big market. Um, um, if you look at Mobile Squared's data, you know, people are or businesses are sending about 4 billion text messages every day uh, to their customers all around the world. Um, and it's a fairly complex delivery chain um, where a lot of different parties add value uh, along the, the way from the business to the consumer. Um, and, you know, it's quite competitive. Uh, lots of, of um, people wanting to serve uh, the enterprises around the world um, and and you know ultimately you know it, it is it, it's it's um, commercials are very, very important so businesses try to minimize the cost for for SMS delivery and and um, aggregators um, try to maximize their profit um, and there are lots of innovative ways to do this um, and, and uh, you know, many totally legitimate ones, uh, but there are also um, ways that basically cross the line for what's, what's uh, in line with operator terms and conditions, regulation, legislation. And there are also certain things you can do that are outright fraudulent. Um, but, um, and, and if you look at, at the data, about a third of all messages sent globally are not sent in a way uh, that the mobile operators intended. Um, and in Europe, I think that number is about 25%. So a little bit lower in Europe, but still a, a big chunk of the market is, uh, you know, crossing the line and using unauthorized routes. Um, most common is uh, of, of all the different ways that you can try to trick the system uh, are SIM forms. Um, and, and we'll look a little bit further into them and, and, and the, the specific dynamics that they have together with uh, data protection legislation, which is a new factor or a re fairly recent um, added factor that, that people need to consider when sending business SMS. Um, so that's a little bit of an intro. Um, let's start with, with uh, SIM farms. Um, so Joanne, if we can move one slide ahead. Um, there are two different flavors of SIM farms or SIM boxes. First of all, you have a standard SIM form where you have a bank of SIM cards that are physically placed into a, a modem controlled by an application that enables the SIM cards to be used to send business SMS. Um, and these typically then leverage, you know, all you can eat bundles of consumer SIM cards. 
um, and, or you know, uh, the very fact that consumer SMS is cheaper than business SMS. Um, hence, you can cut your cost, which is, which is the ultimate uh, ambition here or objective. Um, and for the recipient, it looks like a P2P person-to-person uh, -person phone number. Um, and these standardized SIM farms, you know, it's, it's not one or two modems. These are, are run on an industrial scale to be able to send millions and millions of messages. So quite sophisticated. Um, the second flavor are what we call crowdsourced or distributed SIM farms. And this is where you have a consumer, they download and subscribe to an app that allows the SIM farm operator to use the subscriber's device to send business SMS. So again, you, you leverage the, um, the uh, all-you-can-eat bundle that, uh, or, or you know, pretty large bucket that the consumer has. And, and um, you know, the incentive for the consumer to download this app in the first place is that they get paid by the SIM farm operator uh, or you know, the, the people who built the app a certain amount for every SMS that's sent. And then you send business SMS through this app and then out to um, you know, valid recipients. Um, obviously, you can use it for spam as well, but you know, a lot of, of proper uh, traffic is being sent. Uh, this way as well. Um, and you know the the uh, the <clears throat> value chain here, which is simplistically, um, you have the diagram now there, can obviously be a lot longer. Where you have multiple aggregators um, passing messages to one another until ultimately one of those aggregators decides to use the same form and then off it goes um, which can be so, so it's it's tricky to uh, to have a um, a uh, visibility of these um, of these uh, value chains and and so far you know the the breach of the operator terms and conditions that the same form provided us um, in in uh, you know if if you um, uh, disregard data protection, that breach is really done by the SIM farm provider. So they're the ones that are liable. Um, now then, on the next page though, if you combine SIM farms with data protection, um, the, you know, a different picture emerges. So, um, so here, both the business sending the SMS and the messaging uh, provider, so the aggregator, delivering the SMS need to be in compliance with data protection legislation, that's clear. And um, you know, in Europe, that's called the GDPR. Uh, and there are similar schemes in, in other countries and regions. Um, and um, the, the, the difference with under GDPR is that the data controller is responsible uh, for the entire uh, SMS delivery chain. So whereas previously the SIM farm provider was uh, in breach of the operator T's and C's, here the, the responsibility and hence the liability cascades through the entire chain all the way up to the business. So whereas uh, previously the business didn't necessarily need to care other, for, other than for ethical reasons how their messages were delivered, here uh, they have uh, direct risk uh, and liability. And under GDPR, that risk is, is fines up to 4% of annual turnover or 20 million euros. So it's, it's uh, a fairly sizable amount. And hence, this is the difference um, between data protection or GDPR breach versus other type of breaches. Uh, so the liability lies with the data controller. Um, if you then look at, at uh, you know, standard SIM forms, um, we say here that they, uh, the, the, the risk is that they are in breach of data protection regulation. And um, the argument here is that the, a standard SIM form, the core business model, um, is 
that is based on contractual and regulatory breach. And um, on top of that, they often operate from um, places like China or, or CIS uh, member states where there's a you know a different view of privacy safeguards. Um, so it's it's very unlikely that sim farms will have gone through uh, the ordeal, frankly speaking, to take on all the processes and cost uh, and behavioral change to be GDPR compliant while still being in breach with law. And businesses should proactively ensure standard SIM farms are not part of their SMS delivery chains in jurisdictions with data protection legislation. Um, with crowdsourced SIM farms, it's very clear they are non compliant. Uh, the subscriber that has the app on its phone can gain access to both the message content and the phone numbers to which messages were sent via the app on the handset. And obviously, this is in direct breach of. Um, of um, data protection and we'll hear more from Mariana on this uh, in a moment. Um, so what should a brand do? What, how can a business protect themselves? There are a couple of, um, of things that we would recommend, um, which we have on the next slide, Joanne, if we could move on. Thank you. So first of all, the basics, just know your supplier. You know, is it a reputable company you're working with? Um, from a MEF perspective, have they signed the, mess, the MEF uh, business SMS code of conduct? Do they have a trust in enterprise messaging badge? Um, you know, do they have direct connections? Um, do they have a data protection policy? They have to have that if they operate in Europe, for instance, but just basic things like that. Um, drilling further down, you know, know your messaging delivery chain. Um, you know, uh, we recommend you asking your um, suppliers to disclose their SMS delivery chain. Um, you know, even if they don't have direct connections, it shouldn't be a problem because ultimately you should know or the, the, the supplier should know um, the, the supply chain all the way down to the mobile operator. Um, and make sure you have the right in the contract to ask for proof of uh, that contracts exist along the uh, along the path, um, and here you know uh, a lower than market rate price is always an indication that you know there might be um, uh, something that's not quite right in the in the in the value chain. Um, know your data protection risk. You know ensure that your data protection officer is aware about. You know the risk and, and the, the obligations that data protection put on the sending of business SMS. I think uh, you know this is easily uh, forgotten about or not thought about. And ensure, of course, you have a data protection agreement in place with all your suppliers. Last but not least, um, you know um, trust is good, but control is is, <laughs> is better. Audit your suppliers. Um, what we would say there is use a testing service where you can see how your messages are being delivered. Um, and you know, if, if message content is scrambled, um, for instance, extracting everything but the pin code in a text message, uh, and or the sender ID, um, which used to be a, perhaps an alpha that you sent in with your company name, instead turns out to be a long number uh, when it arrives on the handset. Those are clear indications that there might be a SIM farm um, in the SMS delivery chain. Um, so those are a couple of things that, that we think businesses should do in order to protect themselves against this risk. Um, and with that, I want to hand over to, to Mariana, who has a bit of a, a, um, a specific case uh, with what they experienced at Telefonica in Germany. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Right. Hello, everyone. Uh, exactly. So uh, I could try to give you a little bit of a perspective what we experienced in, in Telefonica uh, as an MNO. Uh, it's clear that we're under constant fire, especially in Germany, <laughs> uh, knowing and being one of the expensive markets for um, A2P SMS delivery. Um, basically, SIM farms have been on the radar for quite some time already, uh, but internally we have 
obviously a combination of processes and, and solutions to control that, to monitor our network and to keep it clean. Uh, talking about the standard ones, of course, now the new phenomenon and innovation, so to say, uh, from the crowdsource sim farm um, gained a little bit of a momentum in the last months uh, with us. And um, um, we um, found out that was again a combination from internal monitoring and also uh, complaints uh, from end customers um, asking why do they get uh, sensitive information like one-time passwords and registration codes etc from brands from social media etc over long numbers over real people's uh, MSI at the ends I mean, I myself have received such such SMS, to be honest, and that was also quite a quite an irritating thing. So um, we've identified a few of those SIM farm providers in the last months in our network. Um, basically, they, all, as Robert explained, they all come from either uh, uh, officially distributed over the Google App Store, over for Android devices, or they could be the um, basically the users can connect over over internet over different platforms or websites and uh, basically the end user could uh, and can um, or get incentivized by the sim farm providers to sell their flat rates in uh, to, to to sell the fresh flat rate so that the sim farm providers terminate a2p sms for brands of course, that's that's wrong on many levels, on especially on legislation levels, breaching several laws, not only GDPR as mentioned, but here we're talking about also German local laws like uh, German Telecommunication Act, which could bring actually imprisonment if if thing gets gets into into a, a suit. Um, there's also the law of unfair competition, where obviously a SIM farm provider is a direct competitor of Telefonica and they incentivize end users to sell their flat rates, which is absolutely forbidden on the other hand in the terms and conditions of the operator. And they use our network to terminate actually SMS, which is in direct competition with us, which is absolutely in infringement with the, with the law. So um, we've gathered all this information and um, we've uh, informed, um, first of all, we've informed, the, we informed Google and told them that they really have to stop this and have to take these apps down from the store because this is absolutely illegal what they do. And in the end of the day, also take a, take a risk of, le of a legal um, breach. Um, and the second step was that we contacted actually these SIM farm providers and we clearly stated in letters what exactly they're reaching and what are their risks, what kind of risks they're taking by, by incentivizing our end users to, to sell their, um, their flat rates to terminate SMS, terminate business SMS, especially sensitive information like MSI SDN that's actually visible on the phones of the senders, which is absolutely against GDPR um, clauses. And uh, of course the end users, I mean, they breach by all chance and by all means their T's and, T's and C's t terms and conditions where it's, it's forbidden to use, um, to resell SMS uh, when they get offers for just flat rates because we just provide them good offers for that and they earn money with it. Um, so this was basically uh, done and uh, it proved to be successful. Um, they understood the providers, uh, traffic is stopped. The problem is that one stops, the next one comes. It's a little bit yeah, like, like cancer. You can't really control it. It's of course doing that also in a way manually is, is quite cost effective, uh, in, ineffective and um, Obviously, a yeah, few things have to change. On our side as an MNO, we uh, of course uh, keep on close, close look for that. And, um, and um, we try to also educate our partners and, and talk about it with such events and such initiatives as, as today. But of course, as, as Robert said, businesses also have to really open their eyes and take responsibilities for what's, what's happening because it's not anymore just optimizing the cost. It's about really <laughs> uh, breaking serious, serious regulations um, in Europe and, and worldwide. So um, that, was, that was our experience in Telefonica. Um, yeah, 
let let's see how how things could could change in the next in the next time coming up rafa from a uh, you know a legal perspective um you're kind of the expert here uh, you know what's 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 your view also from perhaps you know looking beyond your give us give us your insights yeah um well we had the same kind of issues arising in brazil um uh, five years ago six years years ago uh well it was mostly focused on the the issue of pricing uh, but as we were speaking earlier this week uh it's the the cheap option that comes uh, and, and becomes expensive uh, by the end of the day, especially now that we have the, the data privacy regulations in place. So after the DPR in Europe uh, became a reality, what we had in, in the last couple of years uh, was this kind of wave of data, data privacy that was uh, ashore in, in the Americas. Uh, so now we have Brazil and Mexico, the, the biggest Latin American countries, uh, with updated data privacy regulation uh, that is in, in line with GDPR. Uh, and we adopted GDPR kind of as the, the gold standard for, for data privacy. So consent became kind of essential. Uh, data processing and the knowledge of who are the suppliers became essential because uh, as we we were talking, uh, we are we are all in the same boat right now. Like uh, all of the suppliers, uh, they have uh, the same responsibilities as the the data, the brands and and whoever is collecting the data. So what we've been working with right now is uh, oh Joe is back. Uh, Joe, we're we're just uh, talking. <laughs> you about started the without me. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> So uh, what we are seeing is like uh, big brands uh, and like in terms of governance, we are working with compliance uh, for, for data, pri data privacy right now uh, as uh, we have other governance topics on, on the main agenda right now. So uh, sustainability is also uh, becoming something really important. And right now in Americas at least, uh, we have California, California laws uh, becoming kind of the the unofficial standard for the U.S., uh, but they don't go into all of these details and, and levels of data privacy rules and regulations that we have in Europe. At least they are starting, uh, and in the rest of America, is mainly uh, pulled by, by Brazil and Mexico, uh, Argentina, Colombia, other countries as well. Um, Peru and Chile in a, in a minor level right now, uh, but everyone is kind of aware uh, of how to work with it. Uh, we still have a little bit of a problem because of the economic crisis that came with the pandemic. So we've seen a surge specifically right now that we have a lot of people online and like everyone is running their lives on, somehow on a chat box or a video box right now as we are doing right now over here. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we have like a lot of conscious from users and from consumers that uh, like any brand that asks for consent and collects data right now needs to be responsible for the whole chain. Uh, and moving data towards uh, kind of these unofficial or unreliable players uh, becomes a real liability right now, especially because the governments are really eager to implement this new culture. So, it, it, meaning that the, the telecom industry is a, a big target for them. Uh, and the focus is also, it, it's, on, it's usually on big tech and the telecom companies uh, on the, the first days. So, until they move towards other industries, it, it will take a while. Um, and that means that we, are, we need to be the first ones to, to be adapted and to implement these new cultures. It's, of course, uh, it's not from, from the night to the day. It's something that needs to be pushed like a little bit every day. Uh, but we are seeing the surge of investigations and, and the surge of awareness in brands uh, that are really kind of uh, frightening and afraid right now that 
they, they're asking to understand in, the, in, in more detail uh, who are the suppliers, where is the infrastructure, uh, how, how are they collecting data or processing data, where data is being stored, uh, how consent is being managed, and all of this is becoming more and more important by the day, especially right now that we have a lot of people uh, passing their whole days online and the amount of data being generated is really, really big right now. And in terms of different legislations, uh, the, the, uh, in the paper we've given the example of GDPR, um, and do you think that that's then seen as a European problem, or that there's an awareness there that this is a that, that the issue we're talking about today is has an impact globally, depending on where the traffic is uh, 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 terminated, etc. Uh, no, it's it's really global right now. Uh, it has various levels of awareness uh, so far. Uh, usually it moves, uh, every industry and every country moves reactively as far as they have breaches and problems on the press, consumers uh, facing lawsuits, the government issuing penalties and fines. Uh, but everyone right now kind of has the awareness and all of the, the consumers especially in, when using tech, like technology and telecom services right now uh, they are aware and they kind of are asking way more questions than before uh, be it in south africa or the us or latin america and specific to the sim farms and and data protection specifically for uh, yeah specifically for data protection in terms of uh, who are the, the players in the chain of suppliers where is my con where is my consent going where is my data going through uh, do you are you storing my my data in in the country or outside of it so if it's outside of it in which countries uh, is my data open for foreign governments to look at without due process of law or not uh, can I delete my data at any time? Uh, usually what happens with SIM farms is uh, once it, the, the data goes uh, from, from a, like a legitimate brand for, or a legitimate purpose, it, it is used then afterwards for uh, basically spamming, right? And they have a lot of information because they have a history of, of uh, what products you bought or not or a service that you've used or not. They use that information uh, to try to push you more other kinds of products, uh, be they be their legal products or not, uh, even pirate products at, at some times. Uh, mm -hmm. So, or to try to to fish you into like giving more data and trying to scam you. Like the, the number of uh, scamming through SMS in Brazil in the, the, the first three months of the pandemic. Uh, it increased by 70% until people ran kind of, the users ran campaigns with the telcos uh, to kind of illustrate to the, to the oldsters and the, the too young to, to understand anything or how, who to trust online. Uh, so they wouldn't just give information like for, that for them is kind of simple information like the social security number. Uh, that that can have a, a big impact on your lives if it's used in a maleficent way. So, what we are seeing is like sim farms are basically gathering data, and they don't really have any kind of compromise on the terms of how to use that data after that. Uh, so it's basically a free for all. Uh, and of course, if it, this can be traced back for the brands who are ask it for the consent or the data in, in, in the first place, uh, they are the ones who are gonna be uh, penalized by the government. Well, these, are, these are the ones who are going to be somehow pressured by, by the public opinion and, and the, the consumers. Okay, um, so I was going to ask um, a question about what's fueling uh, the growth uh, uh, of this problem, um, but um, uh, someone from the audience has, uh, has asked that much more directly, so I will do that instead. Um, do you think that this is driven by the big SMS senders having unrealistic expectations for cost and hence driving demand uh, down SIM farm routes? Um, and 
you know, we, we, uh, this is all about. Yeah, price uh, is also a, an issue, of course. Mm. Uh, so pricing is, of course, a big drive uh, and a big reason for for that to happen. But it's not just price; it's also uh, the the amount of questions that uh, a telecom company or a legitimate company needs to ask, uh, the amount of bureaucracy that we have, the tax that we pay. So uh, it's kind of the same uh, trade-offs that we have with pirates or pirated content online. So uh, who, who is being harmed by the end of the day? And if this harm uh, can, can go back against us or not with, to the users? So what we understand is uh, it's always a matter of uh, if you want, if you need to to engage your users uh, in a more meaningful and constant way, and this engagement is something that it's not gonna last just a couple of messages, uh, but it's an ongoing relationship. Uh, then it's definitely something that it's worth looking for legitimate routes and and suppliers, because mm -hmm. otherwise this will be tracked back against all of this company. Okay, thanks, uh, Robert. Robert, please. I think my, my so I think it's very hard for a business to um, to know exactly what to pay, uh, what a reasonable price in each market is for SMS. You know, it's it's uh, especially if you're a multinational company, um, and then it's very competitive. Um, people mix um, use of SIM farms with legitimate routes to to take down their cost to be able to offer you know attractive pricing. So I think I think it's it's both the the, the aggregators um, um, and the brands together that that kind of shape the the view of what a price should be. So I don't think it's 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 uh, fair to put all the the emphasis on the brands and their interest to save cost and save money. Obviously, it's there. Um, but it's also difficult for them to know exactly what uh, what a price should be. I think I think it's both push and pull from from the industry and and, and the customers. Mariana, from an M and O perspective. Yeah, I mean that's that's true. I agree, but also I think it's it's a, in a way wrongly considered. As Rafa said, yeah, it's easier like that. That's how the pirate uh, concept works. Uh, yes, it is because when you go to the sim farm, you just I don't know. You just send no it message. without without caring anything yeah. else about no anything else. Asked. Exactly. No questions asked. If you go to an aggregator or you go to the operator, you have to then go through several contractual points and adhere to some rules, etc. That could be annoying. I understand. It's and then more expensive. Sure. But on the other hand, we're talking about here a quality SMS service. We're we're talking about a product that's actually guaranteeing security. That's guaranteeing guarantee, guaranteeing delivery. Um, we say it's the most secure way to uh, deliver sensitive information, one-time passwords, or mobile dance, etc. And if suddenly this information is exposed and it's not adhered or not not guarded by anything, then uh, in the end of the day, I think the whole service gets. Uh, devalued i mean um so it's not necessarily only about the price in the end so that's that's yeah. how i see it so we've talked about the problem um and, and we've, we've we've talked about some of the impacts what's the solution <laughs> um uh, it's also a question uh, from uh from the audience. to remind everyone like uh in the internet and smart smartphone world that we live right now uh we sms competes with other types of messaging that are legitimate so we are not just talking about sim firms competing against uh legitimate routes uh, we have notifications apps and other ways of course uh, and we are always competing with them so uh it's just not a matter of choosing it's not a dual option mode where we have to choose between legal or, or illegal routes uh, we are always competing with other means, of course, and other media of how to reach the consumer. Uh, so in light of that, it's even more strange that companies uh, somehow resort to um, illegal routes because of price, since we, are, we have other competitive pricing as well in other means. It's not, it's not just us, guys. Robert, what's your views and what, what do you think needs to change? 
Um, I think. I think this starts with awareness. I think a lot of people aren't even thinking about SIMFARS being in breach with data protection. I think that's why we have this webinar today in the first place. Um, um, and, and I do think it's, you know, the data protection is unique in the sense that the sender is liable. In all other cases, it's the party that performs the breach that's liable. Here, the sender is also liable. So, so hence, you know, awareness is the big thing. Um, uh, you know, Mariana was talking about uh, chasing this is a little bit like whack-a-mole. Uh, sure, operators can have better protections of their, or in their uh, networks, definitely. Um, but ultimately, it's behavior change as well. As long as there is demand, there will be supply. Uh, other markets, let's not go into that, but they work similarly. Uh, that are also in the gray or the black. Um, so, so brands, uh, and I'd like to 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 address Scott's second question here, where where he asks, alternatively, are mobile operators pricing so high that it gives a big incentive to find a workaround? Um, and again, here you know, with my aggregator hat on, yes, I do think certain markets have price points where. Uh, that aren't optimal for supply and demand for SMS. You know, I think I think the market could be bigger in certain markets. Many markets, I think, price points for SMS are good value. Uh, however, regardless of the pricing policy of the mobile operator, that doesn't change the fact that SIM firms are in breach of data protection legislation. So, you know, from a brand perspective, we can moan about the the, the cost all day long. It's still illegal. So using them is not the answer to uh, you know what what uh, you know operators choose to price. And, I think that's my view. And th th there's a question here on 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 the legality side of things here. So with regards to data protection, will SIM farms or standard SIM farms still be valid for business in the next few years? That's <laughs> quite a leading question. Um, but it, and we, you know, we in the paper we do highlight the differences um, between um, uh, from a data protection point of view of of, of the SIM farm. So, does anyone have a view on that? <laughs> I can go first. Uh, you know, are they valid for business? No, they're not. Will SIM farms still exist? I'm sure they will. Um, but it's up to every business out there that uses business SMS as a channel to make sure that their delivery chain is clean. That's, I think that's, those are my views. Yeah. And um, just um, on the solution side of things, then um, there's a, a question or a comment really um, from Guido about a sensibilization campaign uh, from operators uh, towards brands uh, and gaffer, so Google, Apple, etc., to explain uh, the risks of using SIM farms and how to evaluate the price, which is exactly what we're, we're uh, doing here today to, to, to raise awareness. Um, and Mariana, you, you mentioned you'd work um, on a specific, in your case study, you're talking about engaging Google, et cetera, from an app store point of view. Um, what, what do you think about Guido's uh, uh, recommendation there? Yeah, that's absolutely valid. I mean, we've also started to do that ourselves and we've been in contact with few exactly on the topic, just to highlight that's what's wrong and what they're risking. So uh, yeah, it's a it's a, it's a joint it's a joint process. I mean, it's not only we can't just always blame. Yeah, it's the sim farmers that are the problem. It's not true. Everybody's the problem, <laughs> and everybody's part of the solution in the end. Because if there's no fuel for that, if the brands don't want to use it, the aggregators don't want to also in a way offer it to maximize costs. Then there will be no demand in the end of the day. And uh, of course, yeah, the prices are expensive at some networks. Yes, at some lower. Germany is it the most expensive. They're more expensive, obviously, around the world. Okay, we're a big market and very demanded market. But on the other hand, uh, you know, we're also um, believing that price elasticity could also be driven by by normal economic mechanisms, by innovations, by introducing new cases on the market, new use cases, etc. Then that could also be impacted on the price. But I mean, 
just dumping the price by using illegal ways that's that's that that cannot work and using our infrastructure to do that without as i said the german law of uh, unfair competition basically says when a competitor um, uses the infrastructure of of another competitor without paying a fee for that which is exactly the case of a sim farm that's obstruction of the law and incentivizing end users to breach contract on the other hand another one so yeah okay, the legal you. case is pretty clear yeah well that's a good point is it and and, and that's obviously why we've we, we we've we've tried to highlight that and there's a question here does the mno have a significant gdpr breach risk or is gdpr the data privacy risk borne by the brand and or the sms aggregator and it, and i think that that the the cons the liabilities and roles and responsibilities of the data processor the data controller is is the complexity and as ever when there's complexity there's loopholes so um i mean that's a i'll ask rafa you that question does the m as from a legal point of view does the mno have the significant uh, gdpr breach risk or is it the brand and or the sms aggregator uh, all of those, <laughs> any, any and all of, of those, uh, they are all in, in the lab, with the liability of, uh, of a data breach, and they are all responsible for any data data breach. Uh, that's why, of course, MNOs uh, have the total interest and and focus on trying to to close the gaps. Uh, sites in some of the countries in Latin America, including Brazil and Mexico, uh, the the usage of sim farms is a felony, a criminal felony. So, aside from the the fact that data privacy is a is a real big issue right now, uh, we also have the the felony related to the, the bad usage of telecom networks. So, uh, that that was an issue uh, since the nineties. Uh, it grew over the, the second decade of the 2000s, that, that ends now. Uh, and we have a, like, a lot of cases of uh, sim farm owners or uh, like the infrastructure being, being held uh, criminally responsible by the government, owners uh, responding to criminal charges and so on. So it's even way worse than the, the civil penalties uh, that arise from data privacy issues. So that's, that's a lot of uh, deterrence from the usage of them. In the case of, so Mariana, you called it innovation in sim farms. Uh, so in the case of uh, the apps or the crowdsourced sim farms, then mm -hmm. um, it is very clear that the, the, the risk, the liability, the, the data privacy risk is borne um, by the data, uh, the, by the brand, by the data controller. Um, but but um, from an aggregator point of view, Robert, then what do you do to mitigate uh, uh, the, the, the risks and liabilities? Because as Rafa said, it's, it, everybody in the value chain has that responsibility and, and some risk. Yeah, so, so basically we keep track on, on our delivery uh, chain so use direct connections wherever we have them uh, but you know uh, like everyone else we don't have them everywhere I think that's impossible I think no one has that uh, and then use partners in those countries or for those networks that you don't have a direct relationship with that you can trust um, uh, ultimately we try to buy in a way where uh, we know that we get a dedicated account for a specific network uh, rather than buying, you know, send your traffic in this, um, you know, um, least cost routing um, um, style uh, account where you don't know where it's going to end up. So, so know the chain uh, of delivery, I think, is, is what we do. Uh, in order to be able then to say uh, to our customers that you know sending with us you don't have uh, a risk and we are compliant with GDPR and other uh, data protection legislation. Mariana, what do you think network operators should be doing? 
We're definitely implementing as well the needed solutions for that. Obviously, manually you can do that. You need a certain firewall or spam shield in the back to track that. Um, of course, we have also an anti-fraud department that's <laughs> that's keeping eye on on the on the on the P2P side, and if there's anything that looks strange or fraudulent. Um, we also talk a lot with our partners to understand what's going on on the market. I mean, we're not just sitting there in the ivory tower being locked down. We really want to know what's happening on that market and um, exactly trying to understand. Um, unlucky, some of us received those SMSs and that raised the alarm. Oh, what is this MSI DN? Why am I getting from X uh, social network my password over an MSI DN? But that happens, obviously, if there is momentum, if those SIM farms are actually distributed on the market, they've gained already a certain level or a certain amount, then obviously one of us receives that, that in, 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 in the MNO. Um, and uh, surely, yeah, I mean, raising awareness, following, following, yeah, let's say A2P code of conduct, that's also one good initiative from MEF, adhering to different, yeah, um, procedures to fight that. Of course, we also try to put our contracts to make our contracts very, very strict so that our partners also have in mind it's important not to use these kind of routes and ways to terminate into our networks. Thank you. So, so very specific question here. It's an uh, interesting one. Um, maybe the lawyer needs to answer first, but I will open it to the floor. Uh, when message content is tampered with uh, by a SIM farm uh, in order to evade network walls, uh, network firewalls, uh, does the legal implication stretch further, um, i.e. Uh, is an illegal interception of communication? Uh, well, there are a lot of ways, and each case is a case. Uh, when you look at it specifically, especially on criminal topics, uh, and of course the, the MNO has the ability to use that as a, an exemption from its liability. But of course, until that happens, uh, the MNO would be liable and would be uh, in the need to engage on any criminal procedures. So of course, uh, because of such kind of liability, uh, MNOs have total uh, interest and the ability to just block it through anti-fraud measures as Mariana was talking. So it doesn't really matter the level and the amount of liability that they would have, the simple fact that they could be listed as uh, accomplices to any criminal charges or by not just uh, doing what they should be doing, which is taking care of the health of a certain uh, telecom or, or internet network, uh, that would be enough for them. In Brazil, we have a specific laws for it. For example, there are models for other laws in, in, the South, in Southeast Asia, Asia, Africa, and even in Central America. Uh, our civil internet framework and civil rights framework uh, that basically puts the responsibility on any kind of uh, digital networks if they fail to act uh, whenever they see some kind of uh, harm being done uh, or illegal act being, being done. To their, to their user. Um, thanks, Rafford. Um, so uh, some questions coming in from the audience, I, I guess more broadly on the challenge of SIM farms um, um, and uh, not necessarily specific to data protection. Um, so um, first of all, how will the introduction of eSIMs uh, affect this problem? Um, is that the solution? Um, could it largely kill off SIM farms? Mariana, do you want to go first? <laughs> um, well, I don't know if I could answer that question currently. I mean, we haven't haven't really dived into it or haven't, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't think I can, I can give you the proper answer here. <laughs> no, Robert, no, you got a view on yeah. that? If you don't have a SIM card in the first place, yeah. And at least the standard SIM farm model, I don't see how it could work. So, so for that, yeah. Exactly. 
the the, the crowdsourced one yeah. you can download the app and send mm -hmm. so that wouldn't okay. be yeah, it's a kind of technology solution uh in brazil when we were discussing that five years ago and it, it's ongoing through now the the most successful technical tweaks that we did that kind of blocked uh, most of the sim farm traffic uh, was one of the like like the one in the example of Ethiopia. Uh, so in Brazil, you need to prove or to present a valid ID to to buy a chip, but we don't have a limitation of how many chips or how many sim sims you, you can buy, but they will all be in your name of a of a real person. So that could be traced for, for matters of responsibility. Uh, and in technical terms, we've limited the amount of messages that any given uh, regular SIM could send in a given minute. Uh, it's tweaked by the day, uh, but it's usually around 200 messages per minute. And SIM farms need a, a bigger, a way bigger limit than that uh they, they were they're usually trying to send like a thousand or five thousand messages per minute so usually when when you have this kind of blockage and once this is reached the the user cannot send uh, a lot of messages during the day so basically the scene gets uh worthless and after a while the the financial equation it's it's not worth any longer so they basically move towards other other routes. We also closed SS7 uh, routes for non-authorized senders. Uh, and that these two technical configurations uh, basically resolved kind of 80% of the bad traffic that was, that was coming to, to the country. Yeah, they no, are thanks. not difficult configurations to be done. And I, th I think that uh, kind of answers another question uh, from from Barbara in the audience, um, that in some countries, uh, such as Ethiopia, um, then they have that uh, kind of policy in place where uh, the buyer yeah. has to show their ID, um, there's a restriction on how many cards, etc. cetera. Um, and, and, and that's a good way to facilitate uh, Zimpalm uh, prevention. So yeah. it, it, it feels like, there's lots of technical solutions and, and regulatory solutions, um, but it's but the um, crowdsourced uh, the apps are, are, are a to come back to the topic on data protection um, um, the, the the big risk here. Um, so to finish up, what I'll ask each of you what you know what again what does need to change in terms of we've talked about behaviors so what's what's our call to arms here um uh, in 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 terms of tackling um you know we're raising awareness of the risks um and and, and we know that there's a solution uh, solutions to mitigate those risks um you know what would you like to see um uh, change apart from it to stop happening <laughs> Um, now I, I, it's a little bit reiterating what we've said, you know, awareness um, to, uh, I would say, decrease demand, uh, I think is key. This is a relatively novel angle of this problem. Uh, Sim farms have been around for years, but, but you know, the data protection angle is, is novel. Um, and then it's just the, you know, the normal work that the industry does together, you know, the mobile operators, Mariana had a whole list of things uh, that the mobile operator can do. Um, in addition, you know, Barbara's question and what Rafa talked about, you know, <laughs> you know, retail, uh, the retail side of mobile operators sell the SIM cards and then, you know, that cannibalizes the wholesale traffic, which is not intended you know having a better handle on that from the operator side is is good um and then um you know the, the also then the brands being more conscious buyers of these services and making sure that ultimately the aggregators uh, behave and and uh, provide the service that that they promise i think it's all of those together uh, like always it's there's never one silver bullet all of yeah. this to work together yeah, I mean, I, I think Robert summarized quite well. Obviously, I pay attention to the to the legal requirements, and and that cheap is could get quite expensive in the end. Obviously, 
it's also, of course, uh, country by country. I can only speak about Germany, but in Germany, the laws are quite quite strict and quite <laughs> precise and straightforward on, on that topic. And um, also pay attention to the value chain, how the message is really terminated. And if you get too low price, probably too good to be true. If you get two cents in Germany, that's not that's not correct. That's not something's wrong. Um, and yeah, how the message is delivered, how many stops, is there a direct connection or is it not? Because sometimes sim farms get sold as, yeah, it's a direct connection, but it's not really in the end. So um, I guess when, when one looks into those details, they could make the decisions if they want to risk it and how they want to push the business forward. Um, there's it's another, sorry, see. go on, Robert. Sorry, no, I, you know, it's going to be interesting to see, and maybe Rafa, you, you're aware, but I'm not aware of any uh, lawsuits on this, at least not in Europe so far. Uh, then again, you know, you have know. those in Brazil and what, what's the situation uh, in Brazil? Uh, basically, we've implemented the our new data privacy law that models GDPR. Uh, it's it's it, it became effective last month yeah okay um, right. so but the the, pen, the kind of the administ administrative penalties uh will only be applicable by august of 2021 they were postponed because of the pandemic uh, but that doesn't stop uh lawsuits or consumer lawsuits uh defense uh, bodies uh, or defense associations of consumers to enter on lawsuits, and that is happening this week. We had a breach with 300,000 users of the electric company of the countryside of the state of Sao Paulo, which is the biggest of Brazil. Uh, it affected 300,000 uh, users, and we had, they are still trying to discover what happened, but basically it seems part of the, the breach was due to the usage of, uh, of sim farms. Uh, to send information regarding the state of the energy supply in a given area of a given city in Sao Paulo. And that was Monday in Brazil. <laughs> uh, right now we have multiple lawsuits arising from uh, consumers. A uh, big lawsuit arising from the, the Municipal Defense Consumer Agency of Sao Paulo. Uh, and a uh, federal investigation from the da Data Protection Authority in Brazil, the first one of the kind since we had the new law, uh, and the energy companies facing like uh, penalties of millions of reais or, or dollars, as you wish, uh, because they were basically using uh, SIM farms and other ways of sending messages without any compliance with the law whatsoever. So this is happening as we speak. Uh, it is the same for other cases of, as well. And um, we also had issues already with airlines uh, during the, the pandemic uh, by using SIM farms to send uh, two-factor two authentication codes uh, for users. And those were, were being targeted for phishing reasons. So, yeah, I think that's a good note to, fish, uh, to finish on then, that, that, you know, that, that the risks are clear. Um, I, I guess you could say today's risk in, from sending messages via SIM farms has historically been low in terms of um, uh, the, the risk, but the, the data protect, from a data perspective, protection perspective it's clearly really high um, and as with any legislation when it comes with the hefty fines and the headlines etc etc then um, that's um, uh, th that's when you start to see change along with all of the technical solutions that um, uh, we, we've discussed in terms of combating um, uh, sim farms uh, in, in, in both forms um, Okay, well, thank you very much today. Uh, sorry for disappearing in the middle. Um, and um, MEF will continue to uh, uh, to um, share information uh, on this topic. It, it's a, a key part of uh, the future of messaging program. So um, thank you very much for your time to Mariana, to um, Robert and to Rafa. Uh, and thank you everyone for attending today. Take care. Bye-bye.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.